We're here to talk uh, about Mindful Social, and I'm so excited to have Karen Jeffrey. Karen, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I currently teach at San Jose State University. Uh, I got my master's degree there in sports psychology and then my doctorate a few years after that in sports psychology. But I find myself teaching mostly um, general education courses on stress management and diversity, stress, and health, Mm. which is how social inequities affect groups of people in terms of health outcomes and life expectancy. Partly because I've wanted to go to Africa my whole life anyway, and partly because my GE classes are a perfect opportunity to do this. Um, I was able to lead a uh, foreign study program to Rwanda this past June, San Jose State's first uh, foreign study program in Africa. And Kevin came with us as our official videographer. In terms of a lived experience of resilience and forgiveness, it was just amazing. It was life-changing. It sounds so amazing, and I really do want to dig into it because I was so excited when we met the other day and really hearing the story, and I think there's such an amazing story to tell here. Uh, Kevin, why don't you give us a little background on you as well? I'm Kevin Nguyen. Uh, I was a United States Marine, and after I got out of service doing one tour, I decided to go back to school to be a filmmaker. My first year at San Jose State, I met Dr. Jeffrey, and she had talked about an opportunity to go to Africa, and that's all I needed to hear. I just wanted Mm -hmm. to go, and I decided to make the best out of it, to make a documentary out of the program that uh, San Jose State faculty-led program had to offer because I thought it was a waste if students go there and learn all these things and we're not able to share it in a video form. And I think that's a powerful message other than just hearing somebody speak is to be able to watch what they have witnessed. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I loved when you, you said how much content you had and how, you know, you've been pulling all these little pieces together and you know, that the, you've been telling the story to all of your friends as well, which is, you know, one of the things we do when we come back from vacation. But this isn't a normal vacation, is it? No, it's not. I mean, definitely. <laughs> I, I nonstop been talking about it. And even after talking to the same people, I still have other things I haven't told them. And so every single time we meet, I would tell them new things that came back to memory. Let's talk about this trip. Um, Karen, I know that you wanted to go to Africa and that the school was looking for more of these kind of outreach um, programs. Why don't you tell us how you chose Rwanda? We originally planned to go to Botswana because I have a colleague there who has hosted international programs before, but unfortunately the cost was prohibitive. It would have been more per student than, than, our students could have afforded. So our global partner, which is called Global Engagement, headed by Michael Grosspeach, who lives in Berlin, Michael suggested that we consider an alternative destination in Rwanda. And he said, I know this may come as a surprise to you because people don't typically think of Rwanda as a destination, but in fact, it is now one of the most sought after safest destinations for both education and tourism in all of Africa. And that amazed me because in my head, I'm still thinking about all of the horrible things that happened in Rwanda and it's been more than 20 years. Absolutely. Same here. Uh, what I realized was, first of all, for whatever reason, the version that I heard of the genocide was not the accurate version. There was a lot more to it than that. and. Also, in other words, it wasn't as simple as a Hutu versus Tutsi uh, generations old tribal conflict. There was much more to it than that. And second, we've heard nothing about the progress that the country has made since then. And the progress is amazing. 
it is it is transformed. It's not it's unrecognizable from what it used to be. It's a country that really puts the people first. Everybody at all levels of society. The president is very interested in developing technology and lifting everybody up from mm -hmm. the lowest levels so that nobody's going to be living in poverty, nobody's going to be without health insurance. It's a very inclusive and very forward thinking, very energized society where everybody's just really working together to, without rejecting the past or trying to forget it, completely accept the past and move on to renew and rebuild. Mm -hmm. So can you, for people who, I don't know who, but somebody might not know what happened. And also you told me some kind of stories about why that happened. So let's kind of tuck into that a little bit and give us a little bit more background on what happened in Rwanda. Well, Rwanda's notorious for the 1994 genocide, but in fact, there were several genocides in the decades before that. And my understanding is that the inter-tribal conflict, quote unquote, didn't really exist before the colonial powers of Germany and Belgium moved into the region. Um, <clears throat> and, and Kevin can back me up on this, but the explanation we were given was that the difference between a Hutu and a Tutsi in traditional Rwandan society was how many cows you owned. Mm. Pure and simple. There was no ethnic difference. There was no racial difference. There was no discussion of genetic superiority or inferiority. It was entirely an economic class. Once Belgium, well, first Germany and then Belgium, moved in and tried to retain control over the country. They created and manipulated artificial racial and ethnic differences in order to basically divide and conquer, to keep the people mm -hmm. divided against each other so that they could maintain more of a, a hold on the country overall. Again, the, the 1994 genocide was unfortunately not the first. It was the culmination of a series of events like this that had been provoked by the local government working with the, the colonial powers who switched sides between Hutus and Tutsis depending on what suited their political and economic advantage at any given moment. Mm -hmm. In other words, they would back one and then the other and then the other. So they kind of created this environment of, of economic inequality and then stood back and watched people kill each other. Exactly, mm. exactly. And it spun out of control. It, wasn't, it, be, it didn't just become economic inequality, it became racial as well. Um, there, these artificial racial distinctions between Hutus and Tutsis were inflated and uh, there was some extremely inflammatory rhetoric being broadcast over the government radio station, referring to the Tutsis as cockroaches, dehumanizing them, saying that they were what was wrong with Rwanda and that all true Rwandans needed to take the country back from these cockroaches, these, these inhuman insects, by mm -hmm. killing them. Several voices, including religious voices from within the country, noted that this was happening and pleaded for the international community to at the very least shut down the radio station, which okay. would have been simple to do. And it just was not done. The day that it began had been decided in advance and people had been recruited to do the extremely difficult work of hacking each other up with machetes, which is not easy to do. I mean, you have to really it's not like mowing people down with AK-47s. No, Killing it's horrific. Is, is, yes. Yeah. And, and they did it. Uh, that was how far things had gone. Yeah. I, I've heard stories. And, and Kevin, you told us a lot about the evidence of this that is still seen in Rwanda and actually put out with a purposeful intent. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you saw? Yes, from the memorial there that they have, they display the whole history. They're not trying to hide anything. So when we went to the memorial, uh, 
there were stories everywhere on the wall. Uh, as we go throughout the whole tour, we're able to re uh, read a lot of stories and nothing is hidden. And all the stories are probably stories you couldn't find online and all the evidence of skulls being displayed. Um, real actual skull from the genocide are still being displayed. And there are hundreds of them. You saw That's, these in the church, I believe? Yes, church and the memorial. The church actually showed all the ones that were badly beaten. And you can see exactly where, how they got killed. And so many of them, if not all of them, had punctured in the back of their skull. And they were not small bullet holes. They were big, giant ones that's made by machetes or, or other forms of weapons like uh, spears. Um, and the skull sometimes would have a bigger crack than the actual weapon itself because they were beaten multiple times. And skulls of all size, children, adults, uh, you see them all. Wow. And they even have even some of the uh, weapons still displayed there and all the clothing in the church uh, from everybody that was hiding out. Um, and the church itself even had uh, bullet holes, shrapnel holes. This reminds me, obviously, of the Holocaust Museum and some of the things that we see in Germany now that have been preserved really as a lesson to the world and also to tell some crazy people that it actually happened. Um, why do you think that they have preserved this as much as they have in Rwanda? One of Rwanda's main motto is forgive but never forget. Hmm. So to, to move on to build a better life you have to forgive but to refrain from um, repeating history from making the same mistake you can't you can't sweep it under the rug you can't let people forget it not just for themselves but other people around the world yeah they're, they're very committed to telling the story exactly as it happened without trying to disguise it or clean it up or whitewash it or make it less uncomfortable for people to confront they are completely honest and straightforward about it and that is, I think, a fundamental part of being able to forgive and, and move on, is, is not trying to deny any, any of the past, no matter how horrific it was. Mm. Do you think that's where the resilience in the community comes from? I mean, how did they go from these horrific massacres and the incredible pain that they've been through to where now it's a more enlightened and forgiving society. The children who have been born since the genocide seem to be very aware and sensitive to their history, but also very optimistic, very proud to be Rwandans, and they do identify as Rwandans, not as a member of a one tribe or another. Mm -hmm. And I think also the leadership has a lot to do with it. President Kagame, who, who was himself a refugee and who ultimately won the battle to take the country back, someone who survived that ordeal, who, who is able to maintain a positive vision of the future and to act very deliberately to, to make that vision come true. Mm. They were thinking about the future. They're thinking about the next generation. If we look at the Middle East, they've been having an internal war for centuries. But, you know, looking at that, is if you just let your next generations get revenge and just have, keep that hatred in them, you know, they're, they're, they're just going to keep fighting each other until there's nobody else to fight. Mm. So if, if they can teach their next generations, not just to make their, uh, their own generation better but thinking about the future they can just teach them hey yes this is what happened but forgiving them this is where we're on now and it's, it keeps getting better and better and better and i can see it already from being there for two and a half weeks 
things are, are progressing pretty fast, even faster than where I come from. I, you know, I'm from Vietnam and Vietnam's been, the war been over for 40, 50 years, but yet, you know, it's, it's been progressing, but not as fast as Rwanda. And after only 20 odd years, it blew my mind on how the city looks like, the people, how they treat each other, how they treat tourists, how they just embrace other cultures. That's something that was most powerful to me seeing in Rwanda. Mm. Mm. The, the commitment to remember, renew, and rebuild, it's, it's not just lip service. It's a commitment that everybody seems to take extremely seriously, and they, they do it from the heart. And as Kevin said, that, that comes through in, in all our interactions with, with people that we met there. There's a lot of pride in being African. Uh, a lot of the artists and dancers and musicians that we met celebrated we are Africans, this is Africa, and really wanted to embrace that larger identity and share it with the rest of the world mm. in a very positive way. And you told me about um, how it was working in the prisons and with people who had participated in this massacre, what their process is like when they Go, when they're in jail and also when they leave. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is a story we have heard. We haven't actually witnessed ourselves, but mm. we were connected with a, a school from Buffalo, New York. And we're, I was uh, com you know, just kind of networking with other students and just asking them what they're, they have done in their program. And they have told me they went to this one prison where some of the prisoners from the genocide are still there. They're, they actually turn themselves in. Um, they've um, confessed on who they've killed, if they actually know them, how many people they've killed, where they have buried them, so that they, you know, they can retrieve all this body. And at, there at the prison, you can actually communicate with the prisoners through a translator asking them personal questions like what, what was going through your mind when you're doing all this and how did you feel and they would actually tell you mm. and so they're they're for they're, they want forgiveness that's why they're they you know they turn themselves in in the first places and while being in there um the more crime you have um, confessed the longer you stay so there's still people in there that that's still um doing their time just because of they have done that much over 24 years already they're still locked up mm. but when they come out uh one of their um procedure in in this process is to go to the family of people that they have killed and ask for forgiveness actually walk up to the door knocked on the door um introduce themselves tell tell the family what they have done to their family members and ask for forgiveness. Wow. That's just something I don't know if anybody else in the world can just could do that. But not only that, once the family do forgive him, they build him a house. They know he just got out of prison after 20 something years. He has nowhere to go, he has nowhere to live. They actually build him a house. It's not the greatest house in the world, but it's still a shelter. You know, and not only just helping them build a house, but it's near them on, on maybe one, the property, wherever they could. So they're so, neighbors. Yeah, so they, they would become neighbors. That's and incredible. I, and that's how only how you're able to work together. You help them you know, find a place to live, help them find a job, and then you continue living life. Hmm. And you talked too about the community aspect and how you know, this, this resilience and also this feeling of forgiveness and community has really, um, it, it's all through the entire community and that they, they help each other. So they have a day called Umaganda Day. Usually it's the last Saturday of the month where the whole community comes together and does complete tasks, whatever that needs to be done plant, either planting trees building houses picking up trash 
just helping one another out. Well, uh, we weren't there for that actual day, but when we were there, the village had the day on and off days, not the last Saturday of the month, but they just had uh, this Umaganda day on a weekday just because something needed to be done. So we helped a village um, build a house. We walked maybe a quarter of a mile to this creek where there's just rocks and boulders everywhere in the creek and we transported it back to where they're building the house. Now mm -hmm. the house is only made out of bamboos, rocks, and mud, more like clay. Um, and you see just women, children, men, boys, as everyone coming together. There were at least maybe 40 to 50 people there. And everyone has their own little jobs. All the women went to go pick up rocks. All the men chopping down bamboos. All the, even the children, even this little four-year-old, he took a small, it's probably the rock the size of his hand, he put it on his head and started walking with everybody. Mm -hmm. And it was just an amazing sight to see, just that the whole community comes together, not just the, their own family, just like over here. If my house were, has a hole in the wall, it's going to be up to me and my brothers to go fix it. You know, but over there, the whole community comes, and I don't think you know, they, they go knocking at each other, their neighbor's door asking, hey, we have this hole we need to fix. Can you help me? I think once somebody started working, people see it, they just come and help you. Hmm. That's really beautiful how that, that much love in the community. And, you know, I, I can see that the trauma that they've been through does bring them together as well as feeling that they're supported. I can't really explain why this is, but there seems to be, along with the straightforward recognition and, and acceptance of what happened, there's no recrimination. It's, it's as if when someone asks you for forgiveness, you, you forgive them and it's very genuine. Mm -hmm. we, we saw videos in the Memorial Museum of people saying, if, if somebody came to my door and asked me, for forgiveness, of course I would forgive them instantly. And, and they really mean it. And they just sort of set, accept the past and move forward. There's no, there's no grudges. There doesn't seem to be any lingering resentment or lingering reservations about working with people who were your enemies a, a generation ago. Everybody just seems to be on the same page and really want what's best for the country. That's amazing. It really is. So what do you bring back from this trip that you want to offer to people? Um, what, do you, what do you want people to hear how they can apply this in the rest of the world? First of all, just that it's possible. Hmm. I think a lot of times when you when you hear these kinds of things, you you know, there's a skeptical reaction that, oh, well, that couldn't really happen in real life, but it can. We saw it for ourselves. That's the amazing thing. That it it not only can happen, it is happening. And if it can happen in one part of the world, it can happen in other parts of the world too. Hmm. Hopefully not being caused by something yes. as horrific. Yes. You could actually see this and learn a lesson from it and, and take it from there. Absolutely, without a triggering event like that first. But, mm. but yes. And that's why the memorial and sharing the story is so powerful, so that we don't have to go through it to be able to learn from it. Mm -hmm. We can take somebody else's story and if we can just really find out what they have done and how they have overcome it, we can start implement that in our own lives instead of having going through something so terrible to realize it. Oh. Uh, for me personally, coming back, I feel like uh, I was telling everybody since I landed in New York, uh, going back home, I felt kind of a little bit of depression just mm -hmm. because in my mind now I'm going through the airport just seeing people being rude to each other. They're kind of minding their own business. No one's really saying hi to anybody when you pass by them. It really made me miss Rwanda instantly. 
just mm-hmm. because when I was getting off the airport, I was expecting, you know, everybody I walked by, they would, we would greet each other and um, just, just being able to talk to the person next to you when they're just sitting there waiting for the airport. I didn't see that at all. Everyone just took out their iPad, iPhone, put earplugs in, and they just worrying about themselves. Mm. And that's what I didn't, didn't see in Rwanda. Um, people want to communicate. They, they want to know your story, especially if, if they know you're not from around there. They want to know you. They want to know where you came from. What are you doing here? How, how do you like it here? That's the number one question I always get from everybody was like, how are you enjoying? And I loved it. And coming back here is not the same. No. And so it's not. And I try to, I try to be the one who opens conversation up when I see people. Especially I want to share the story where I've just been. Especially when you're in an airport, everyone's going somewhere or everyone's going from somewhere. And sometimes it's an interesting story to tell. And yet I'm there walking around. I just came back from Africa and nobody knows about it because nobody asked. What I've been doing is, is just sharing my story with everybody I've encountered. Either it was somebody random or all my best friends to all my colleagues. It's, it's, I'm excited to share it. Like, I just can't wait to, to uh, see somebody who I haven't seen yet since I've been back to tell them, you know, to repeat myself. And it sounds like a broken record, but I love the same song. And just mm-hmm. thinking about the future, wanting to come back, I get excited as if, you know, I'm about to go for my first time again. That's wonderful. How about you, Karen? I think for me, the, the big change was not just knowing intellectually that there's different ways of being in the world and being alive and being a part of the human race, but actually going somewhere where it really is different and seeing, I think, some of the best of humanity in ways that I've never seen it before and realizing that it's not just an abstract possibility. It, it's a, it, it is a real possibility and there's parts of the world where it's actually happening. It's unfolding right now. Mm. And seeing that for oneself, living it for a couple of weeks, gave me a sense of optimism that I haven't had for a long time mm. because I've seen for myself that it can happen. I just want to share that experience with as many people as I can now. Hmm. Yeah, and, and bringing that to the world and, and sharing that is huge, especially with the culture that we're seeing, not just in the United States, but all around the world, uh, this divisiveness that we're seeing. And if yeah. we don't want that to keep going, we need to talk to people in airports. We need to, you know, pick up our trash. We need to take out our headphones. All of those things are, are crucial. And this isolation that we're creating isn't helping us at all. And I love that San Jose State is really supporting that initiative. The, the best way to understand people is to actually go meet them and talk to them. Yeah, there, I mean, knowing about it in theory is no substitute for having direct experience. And, Absolutely not. Um, yeah, we don't, I mean, I think in this country, we just don't know what we don't know. All we know is what we've experienced and experiencing a completely different way of life and a completely different approach to being a human being on the planet is just eye-opening and, and invigorating. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one day we went out for this. I decided to, to wanted to go for a run, not knowing that we landed on a day where they had a thing called car free day. So we went running and we don't see any cars or motorcycles on the street at all. And police officers in the street were directing us where to run. And so we ran on one side of the street, I looked around, I realized, oh my goodness, this is a lot of people running at 7 a.m. Children running with their parents, running with their grandparents. And on the other side of the street, they're all bikers and rollerbladers. And this is amazing because they made it safe for us to exercise. 
Mm. And so they do this uh, for four or five hours, um, the first and the third Sunday of the month. No cars are allowed until I think 10 or 11 a.m. And you are just running freely. But not only that, seeing a group of people motivating each other while they're running was what really gave me goosebumps because mm. this one group of runners I saw, one person kind of fell behind and you see the, the leader of the group slow down uh, for the other person to catch up and whisper some motivating words to get them going and you see them to joining the pack again. Keep in mind, Rwanda is known for the land of a thousand hills. There was no <laughs> flats. It's either uphill <laughs> or downhill. So you, you, you have to make the decision of do you want to go down first or go up first? <laughs> and just, just to see people going up and down, those hills were just amazing. We decided to go downhill first. And I, mean, I think that was a good thing just to get our body warmed up because going uphill first, I think we would have been tired and we will just walk home. But coming <laughs> down, we, we felt warmed up. We were stretched out. And when we ran up, it, it was amazing. And seeing other people, I remember this two boys, they were running along with us for the longest time. Um, they, they were like eight and 10 or something. Yeah, they're, they're two brothers. And, and when they were running with us, they, they kept looking over, smiling, waving, and just enjoying their, their car free day. It's, that's something I think Americans need to incorporate that somehow i know we we have a very busy life where we can't afford to close down a highway for an hour let alone four hours on a weekend but we need somewhere where we can exercise safely as a yeah. community because if you see other people everybody in your town are running you're going to end up you want to run you want to go out there and see who else is running so you can join them but they don't they're just gonna not not be able to take advantage of any of that hmm. that's very cool yeah there, there's actually an event coming up in san jose in september called viva calle that is i think uh not based on anything in in africa i think it's based on something that started in central or south america but but there it is a community-based get out and enjoy the outdoors together doing physical activity so we're, we're trying to do some of that here, but yeah, we definitely don't have it, you know, we don't do it twice a month like Rwanda does. Do right. Year. Right. Um, maybe we can go to those events here in San Jose and kind of spread the words in Rwanda. So yeah. We're aware of it, so we can make it um, and, you know, slowly progress to what they do in Rwanda. I'm down. Let's do it. <laughs> I'll watch. <laughs> <laughs> The, the other thing I wanted to add, in addition to what Kevin said, is we we were very fortunate that, for various reasons, we ended up meeting a lot of dancers and artists mm. in Rwanda. And I think that that's partly because arts and dance are much more encouraged in Rwanda than what we're used to here. And we were just amazed at how, as Kevin said, they just really wanted to share their their skills with us and have us participate in what they were doing and uh it wasn't based on competitiveness or a profit motive or anything like that they were just they just loved what they did and they loved to have some new people to share it with mm. and um we're you know we're still in touch with a lot of those people and we're hoping to see them again next year and also maybe even bring some of them over here uh, to San Jose before before next year so that they can you know they can they can share what they have to share with with some of our students wonderful wonderful I've noticed over there uh, they will they want to give more than they receive so every single time we perform something small teach them something small they would give us back 10 times more so we have two dancers and they perform a five minute dance routine. 
they came back at us with a 45 minutes performance. Wow. Where they actually rehearsed for, you know, a whole day. They had two days to, re they thought they had two days to rehearse, but when they found out we were leaving early, they just got together, rehearsed one last time and performed. It was an amazing performance with live music. Um, costumes. Costumes with different groups, uh, with different styles. So they would start off with, uh, you know, hip hop, and then they would go to traditional. Then it was just, it was a whole story. Especially mm -hmm. when they uh, sung the, uh, uh, the song, We Are The World. It just gave me goosebumps when all everybody in, in the whole cafeteria was singing that. So, like, I was just stunned. I just couldn't believe that this is happening and they were doing this for us because we showed them five minutes of our dance move. Mm -hmm. And when, 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 I, when we left that day, in my head, all I was thinking about like, how can uh, uh, these young women, they're so passionate about what they do that they wanted to give us something back. But, and that's just not the, the only time I've happened. One of our uh, participants, she's a singer. She sang one song. She actually didn't complete the whole song. They sung back to us and danced for about five, six songs. You know, that's, that's just how they are. And whatever we do, they would try to reciprocate in the same way, but more. Everything we did was acknowledged. Everything we did was reciprocated. Uh, and it was all, uh, it, it was just a desire to give and, and share. That, you know, no ulterior motives, no hidden agendas, just, uh, you know, we want to thank you and this is how we express our thanks. Mm. Yeah, Kevin is right. We got, we got thanked with songs and dances pretty much everywhere we went. It was amazing. That and it was sounds... another thing that we knew, you know, we didn't even know to expect this going over. This was a part of the country that we hadn't heard about. Mm. That sounds country. like it was an amazing experience. No, it was just, and we found everything else ourselves. The program didn't say you're gonna learn how the, the Wanda and uh, forgive each other or, or how they treat each other, how they have all these community days where they work together. None of that was on the itinerary. We found, we just went and explored and, and realized it ourselves. And maybe that was part of the program was to let us realize it for ourselves. It kind of unfolded for us as we spent time there. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, I, I thank you so much for sharing this with us. This will be really fascinating to see how this evolves. And I hope that people find a lot of value in it.